Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, this facial paralysis Q&A. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for organizing uh, today's meeting. It's actually Facial Paralysis Awareness Week, so this is very apropos to uh, be with you and share uh, uh, some of my thoughts on um, uh, the questions that have been submitted. I'll try to um, give everyone, everyone is at a different probably stage or phase of dealing with either for themselves or a family member with facial nerve disorder. So um, I'm gonna try to give a five to 10 minute summary of a very basic explanation of different um, causes, types of facial paralysis, how I look at things, and what you need to know about facial paralysis, because the knowledge uh, of your experience, as well as the knowledge of what's going on is really, really helpful. Hopefully you guys can also become, um, you know, uh, supporters of others in this field and uh, with these same issues. So I hope that we'll be able to give you um, some level of better anatomic understanding of what's going on. Um, at the end of the session, if we have time, I'd like to have kind of create a little, um, you know, uh, group session so that we can all communicate with one another and talk to one another and maybe some open mic questions. If we have time, we'll see how long. We have a lot of questions that were submitted uh, beforehand, but um, it's so nice to see everybody and uh, have you guys join us from probably all over the world. And I wanna give a big shout out to Lisa McKinley, who's been uh, an amazing leader of the Facial Paralysis and Bell's Palsy Foundation for over a decade. And she is tirelessly helping people from around the globe uh, uh, seek solutions and support them. And uh, she's been just an amazing partner uh, for this foundation and leader for this foundation. So thank you, Lisa for organizing this and being so amazing for so many people. Okay, so let's kind of go into, I wanna kind of, so we're all on the same page, understand and explain a little bit of anatomy. And if um, everybody can mute their phones, that'll be wonderful or uh, cell phones or uh, the Zoom. Thank you so much. So the anatomy of the face is, as you could imagine, fairly complicated. Uh, we have 17 muscles on either side of our face that allow us to express ourselves. And these muscles are controlled by various areas in our brain. And one of the most important things um, to understand is that 99% of the time, our facial expressions, whether it's anger, sadness, smiling, happiness, all that stuff is spontaneous and emotional. We're not thinking about it. We may be able to override it, but for the most part, it's spontaneous and natural. The way that the brain communicates to the uh, facial muscles is through a nerve called the facial nerve. To think about the facial nerve, it's like a fiber optic electrical system. And these fiber optic uh, electrical wires are traveling all together as they leave the brain. They go through a bone behind your ear. If you touch the bone right behind your ear, that's called the temporal bone. They travel through that nerve in a very circuitous way. They come out just below your earlobe into a gland called the parotid gland. And then they start dividing up into micro nerves that go into these various muscles. Some muscles get multiple nerves going into them and some nerves actually go into multiple different muscles. There is a lot of cross connectivity and arborization like a tree. And our Facial muscles produce a variety of different actions to allow us to express ourselves. And these actions, a lot of time, are in opposite directions. 
And sometimes when we are having a certain expression, certain muscles activate a little bit, certain muscles activate a lot. But as you could see the directions of the muscles, they're all going into various different directions. So when we smile, when we smile big, five key muscles are very, very important and activated. And these are called the levator muscles, the zygomatic muscles, and the depressor labia inferioris. That's bringing the lower lip down. Because what we want in an ideal smile is a spontaneous, natural, and emotive. We want the corner of the mouth to move symmetrically up. We want symmetrical laugh line. We want symmetrical teeth show, which is very, very important. We want symmetrical timing. And we want it to be cosmetic. This is a lady who I'll show you later her pre-op had uh, facial palsy that we treated. And again, to get this spontaneous, natural and emotive smile, we have to really think about maintaining, preserving or recreating the neuromuscular pathway that I just outlined for you guys. That gives us the only op opportunity, the only option to get a great smile. Now, what are the common causes of facial paralysis? By far the most common is called Bell's palsy, which is a viral induced inflammation of the nerve as it travels through the bone behind the ear. It's commonly thought to be the herpes simplex virus, the cold sore uh, that causes Bell's palsy. Another very related um, cause of facial paralysis is Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. It's caused by another virus, the uh, varicella zoster virus, the chickenpox virus that causes shingles. And this comes not only with facial paralysis, but a lot more complications like rashes in the ear, worse hearing loss, dizziness, etc. So these are, I would say, the two most common causes. Um, the other very commonly seen in my practice are people who have brain tumors, such as acoustic neuromas, meningiomas, et cetera, that are involving the area just as the nerve travels through from the brain into that bone behind the ear. Now, typically speaking, these are benign brain tumors. They themselves don't cause the facial paralysis. For the most part, the facial paralysis takes place after surgery or during surgery, the nerve gets stretched. Maybe it loses a little bit of blood supply. Maybe it gets damaged because it's involved wrapped around with the tumor. So it is a very common cause that I see, but it's not as often as Bell's palsy or Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Trauma to the bone that's behind the ear can also sever the nerve. Patients can be born with congenital or developmental paralysis. Um, that affects either one or both sides of their face. If it's both sides of the face, we typically look for syndromic issues and typically they have Mobius syndrome, which involves not only the facial nerve, but also the uh, nerve that goes through the eye muscle. Tumors of the parotid, either benign or cancerous can cause facial paralysis. Lyme disease that we didn't talk about earlier is another infectious disease that can cause facial paralysis. And stroke is a common presenting cause of facial paralysis, but, but a lot of people who have a stroke, if they uh, fortunately survive, the stroke is not severe enough and many of the patients actually get their facial nerve issues um, addressed and resolved. Regardless of the cause of facial paralysis, there certain common types that we see, results that we see. So this is a young lady who has Mobius syndrome. She is trying to smile, but she just can't. There's no activity. There's no movement. You see, she has a symmetrical face, but she has no ability to express herself, which is devastating and very, very, very challenging. The young girl in the center, has a complete one-sided paralysis. So there's no activity on the right side of her face. All the activity is on the left side. We see her eyes 
can't close well. She does not have a laugh line there. The corner of the mouth is down. She can't show her upper or lower dentition on the right side. The last individual you see here is someone who has synkinesis. So she had a facial nerve injury that did not cause complete paralysis. It regenerated, but it regenerated irregularly. I'll show you guys in a second what happened. So if you see the left side of her face, she actually has a laugh line. She actually has tone. She has muscle activity. She actually, her eyes close when she's trying to smile. So it's a, these three are very, very different. And then there's other types of facial paralysis, something called a congenital unilateral lower lip palsy, where there's really no problem with the upper lip and the corner of the mouth, but more of a problem of the lower lip moving down. This is actually a very, very common cause of facial paralysis, but it's pretty much either unidentified or parents take their kids to the pediatrician and they're like, oh, don't worry about it. It's also called an asymmetric crying facies. So it's a pretty common cause of facial paralysis. And the last common type that we see is what I call a mixed partial paralysis. You kind of have some activity, but it's not synkinesis and there's some activity in the lower face, maybe not in the mid face. So it's, it, it, it falls under almost no category. Now, what happens when a nerve gets damaged, whether it's from Bell's palsy or post-surgical from an acoustic neuroma or whatever? So if the nerves regenerate, if the nerve is not fully cut and it's just injured, for it to normally regenerate, each of these micro nerves need to go back to where they were supposed to go. So this is a normal facial nerve regeneration. So there are a lot of patients with Bell's palsy that regenerate completely normally, about 70 to 75%. Now, for a patient that has no facial nerve regeneration, what happens? Like, let's say there's an acoustic neuroma, let's say the nerve has been cut in a surgery, then the nerves just don't regenerate. There's no connections, right? So the muscles of facial expression do not get any nerve input. And as a result, they will atrophy like this. Everything will fall down. The muscles after a certain period of time will atrophy if they're not renervated, if there's no neural input, whether from the facial nerve or some other nerve source. And this individual that has complete paralysis is someone who had an acoustic neuroma, the neuroma was removed and the nerve for whatever reason was injured at the time of the surgery or did not get adequate blood supply and never regenerated. Now, what happens when the nerve gets damaged and we get synkinesis? In that case, the nerve regenerates, but they crisscross, they miswire. And sometimes certain nerves don't actually get activity back. So this is what we call aberrant nerve regeneration. So in a normal nerve regeneration, when someone's trying to smile, the nerves that go into those muscles that help us get a normal smile, get activated, normally coordinated, and all the other muscles get just a teeny bit of activation, not a lot of activation. But when nerves get abnormally aberrant facial nerve regeneration, like in synkinesis, when someone's trying to smile, not only are the smile muscles getting activated, but all the other frowning, um, uh, puckering, eye muscles. So you get a tug of war on your face. So the corner of the mouth stays down, the upper lip stays down, the upper the lower lip stays up. There's variations. Some people are very, very mild. Some people are severe. So that's kind of the main sense of what everyone needs to be aware of when we are looking at facial nerve issues. So um, I hope that was, um, that was you know, fairly straightforward and explain some of the basics of how we look and uh, analyze someone who comes in to see me. So one of the key things 
are that, you know, I, I started, I was, I trained about 24 or five years ago for about six, uh, seven years. And during that time, things were pretty static. There wasn't a lot of treatments. And then the, when I started my practice, we started doing a lot more cutting edge advanced treatments that help a lot of the patients who have complete paralysis get their smile back. And then we were like, okay, maybe we could use the same techniques on individuals who have the synkinesis or the congenital unilateral lower lip palsy. And the results were not that exciting because those individuals had pretty good appearance, pretty good symmetry at rest. And for us to go put in muscles and tendons and nerve grafts didn't really get them that natural smile. So over the last 10 years, there's been a huge change in the way I look at things and the way we analyze and treat patients. And it's been really, really, really wonderful. So I'm going to now get into the questions that were submitted. And hopefully if we have time, I'll try to answer some of the questions you may have from the questions that I've answered, because I'm sure uh, there'll be some questions that come up. So this, uh, and I'm gonna go basically in the order that the questions were submitted to be fair to the people who had submitted them earlier. So I had Bell's palsy in December of 2020 and I still have tinnitus. Is that common? Is there anything I can do to relieve it? So this is uh, from Lori. Um, so tinnitus is ringing in the ear. And for the most part, ringing in the ear happens when we have some level of hearing loss. That's the main cause, main reason. Tinnitus is a symptom. It's not really a diagnosis. It's a symptom of something else. Now, can Bell's palsy cause tinnitus? It's not a very common associated process, but Bell's palsy, there is a nerve that runs with the facial nerve that goes to this little muscle that helps us with kind of um, reducing loud noises. So if that nerve also has synkinesis, then potentially there could be some difference between the two sides and you can have tinnitus. So my recommendation, obviously make sure, I'm gonna preface all my recommendations by saying, these are all not real medical recommendations, it's just suggestions because you have to get seen by a facial nerve expert whenever you have facial paralysis, it's really, really important because there could be some very complicated process that's going on that's not related. There's a lot of misdiagnosis, quote unquote, of Bell's palsy, and we'll get into it. Somebody put a really good question to that for that. So always see a facial nerve expert somehow, either through virtual evaluations or in person. And that's the one saving grace of, um, of COVID is that, you know, I've been doing virtual evaluations and virtual discussions for a long, long time, but I think people are now a lot more aware and you can be in, um, you know, Europe and get a virtual evaluation with a doctor in, you know, California. So it's kind of cool. So definitely go see someone or talk to someone, but the most important thing is get a hearing test by ENT doctor so that we make sure there's nothing else going on. Also get a full evaluation and see what is happening because this is one of those situations maybe an MRI of the inner ear is important and the brain is important because sometimes people get misdiagnosed with Bell's palsy, but they may have an acoustic neuroma. So this is very, very important to follow up. The second question was how likely is Bell's palsy to recur? So the likelihood of Bell's palsy actually is very, very low. Um, one in 40,000 per year per population. So it's a very low number. Now, if someone has had Bell's palsy, the chances of them getting Bell's palsy again is very low. It's very, very low, but it is probably higher than the general population. So this is where it's important for everyone who has had Bell's palsy to really be connected with an ENT, or a facial nerve expert 
or a neurologist so that if they start getting symptoms again, they quickly get on steroids, they quickly get on antivirals because this timeliness of getting high dose steroids and antivirals directly reduces the risk of long-term synkinesis. Next question, is it common for the affected eye which could not blink during Bell's palsy episode to become smaller and hard to see out of? Um, this is Wendy. Wendy, great question. And I just showed you an example of what happens, right? Someone at the beginning of your Bell's palsy, your face has no activity, flat. There's no nerve going in. As the nerve regenerates, if you develop synkinesis, you actually get overactivity. So your eyes, when you have no activity, is wide. You can't close it. But when you get overactivity, it almost closes too much. That's why we oftentimes use uh, uh, either nerve procedures to reduce the overactivity or Botox to reduce the overactivity or both, as we've seen uh, in uh, my practice over the last few years. The next question is, I've had Bell's palsy recur five separate times since 2015. I've had several MRIs, all normal, blood tests for Lyme, all normal. What else could be causing this? And this is by Tarja. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. So this, unfortunately, is one of those questions that's difficult to answer. We just don't know why somebody gets recurrent and repeated Bell's palsy. My own personal guess is there's probably a likelihood of the narrowing of that canal that basically is the bone behind the ear. And so any level of inflammation can cause your nerve to shut down and reawaken, shut down and reawaken. But we don't have an obvious and great answer for that. That has not been studied correctly or appropriately so far but great thing to look at. Okay, what is an appropriate, this is a great question. What's an appropriate age for a child born with facial paralysis to begin surgical treatments? This is from Elizabeth. This is a fantastic question because it comes up all the time. And the answer to this is a little complicated because my personal opinion is as early as possible because we want your children to not to have confidence and improve quality of life. Everything we do for anyone who has a facial nerve issue ultimately is to improve the joy of life, quality of life, confidence, go out there, not worry about your facial difference. So the earlier we get to treat children who are born with facial paralysis or develop a you know, facial palsy, I believe better, especially before they go to school, even preschool or elementary school. Um, and I am a firm believer that the earlier, the better. Now, there are some, you know, you don't want to start before the age of one, but you also don't want to start when they're teenagers. The other thing that I always tell people is that this is something that as a parent, you need to get educated learn everything you can. And you can't push this off till the kids are 18 or 19, in my opinion. I mean, you could make a decision of saying, no, I do not want to have any treatments for my kid, but don't push it off till after they're adults. Because these facial differences, facial paralysis in children, long-term can be significantly impactful in their life. Um, in their socializing and their confidence. Um, we know that, you know, for some of us who had really bad acne, how hard it was to go to school when you had like a big, you know, acne on your nose or face. Imagine when there's facial differences, when your smile isn't great and people are teasing you. So I, um, I'm not saying everybody needs to have surgery or treatments, but I do think it's a decision that, uh, parents need to make early on um, for their kids and for their kids' wellness. All right, next question. What non-surgical treatment options are available for synkinesis? So 
Synchinesis, like I was saying earlier, the treatment options until a few years ago depend, depended really on who you went to. If you went to a neurologist, they would say, congratulations, you've recovered from your treatment and uh, go on and live your life. Then um, about seven, eight, nine years ago, I think a lot of neurologists and a lot of uh, uh, plastic surgeons um, really started advocating the use of uh, Botox. Um, and then I think plastic surgeons also started using some of the techniques that we had really gotten good at for patients with complete paralysis on patients with synkinesis, but the results were, I would say, less than great. So today, the way I look at it, to get the best outcome, we need to combine treatments. It's just like heart disease. Someone who has multi-vessel disease, they may need to have surgery, they may need to have stents, they need to have a good diet, they need to exercise uh, and lifestyle changes. And Bell's palsy and facial paralysis is very similar. We need to do great physiotherapy and neuromuscular retraining. And there are now a lot of great experts that are doing it. Botox and fillers, I believe, are really important in the treatment plan for people who have synkinesis and people who don't have synkinesis to create symmetry, reduce overactivity of the platysma that can cause cramping and pain and suffering for a lot of people, to reduce the narrowing of the eyes, to improve the symmetry of the eyebrows. And I use targeted Botox to actually symmetrically improve the smile. And lastly, kind of customized facial reanimation. Um, and really not focusing on increasing power like we do for individuals who have complete paralysis, but to fine tuning the overactive nerves. And that has been a game changer, I think in my opinion, uh, because we're able to, through an outpatient procedure and really analyze the patient's needs, go and reduce some of the overactivity of the nerves that are turning the corner down, that are keeping the upper lip and lower lip tight together that are reducing the overactivity of uh, the muscles. We're just publishing data on actually how to improve brow elevation and eyelid narrowing. So the combination of the non-surgical and the surgical treatments gives us the best possible outcome, getting as close as we can to a, to a near normal appearance. It's not ever perfect. Nobody who has complete facial nerve injury can ever get back to perfection, but we can get really close and get meaningful improvement in quality of life. Um, so the non-surgical component is great physiotherapy, stretching, neuromuscular re-education, um, Botox, fillers, relaxation techniques, psychotherapy. There's a lot of emotional trauma that happens when someone has facial paralysis. I truly believe that's an important part of the treatment plan. So those are the non-surgical, and then we have wonderful, at least um, wonderful treatments than surgical procedures that have really, really have made meaningful changes in people's lives. Um, Next, great. And by the way, the questions are fantastic. I really, I like every question because these are all questions that come up over and over and over again, but everyone really uh, submitted fantastic questions. How long should I wait after the onset of facial paralysis for whatever reason to cons uh, consider surgical treatment? This is from Carol. Um, great question. And it really depends. So I'll give you two scenarios that are common. One scenario is someone who had a brain tumor, like an acoustic neuroma, they had, um, before surgery, they did not have any facial paralysis. Postoperatively, they wake up and the face is not moving. So for that individual, and the surgeon says, oh, the nerve was intact, we were monitoring it, everything looked good. So for that individual, I want to see progression. I want to see if there is improvement. If at six months, that individual's face 
looks like the patients that I showed you where their face is completely paralyzed. There's no activity, there's no tone. We want to get into treating that individual right away because we don't we want to revive their facial muscles. Because if we can revive your muscles, we're reviving 17 muscles. If we go do a muscle transfer, we're bringing you one muscle. So reviving someone's muscles, really, really important. And we have wonderful techniques that can really do that. And then we can add a spontaneous emotional factors as well to help that individual smile really, really naturally. So that individual, six months, because studies have shown that Every month after six months, the chances of the muscles reviving becomes less and less and less. Your best chance is early. Now we can, if someone presents a year and a half later, I would still do that. But really maximum time is two years, but the results are not as good at two years as they are at six months. So that's a very important issue. The second issue the semi, a second common uh, uh, consideration is someone who had been diagnosed with Bell's palsy. At three months, their face starts regaining tone. We start seeing a little laugh line. We still see, we start seeing some eye closure. That's good news. That means that they actually truly have Bell's palsy and they don't have some other process like cancer or something like that. If at three months they have no activity, we wanna get an MRI. We wanna get a CAT scan. We wanna really start investigating that because they have been, they may have been either misdiagnosed, but really the diagnosis of Bell's palsy is in place when we see tone back. If we don't see tone back, we want to investigate. So if at three months they start regaining tone, they start having activity, then we continue observing that person. Maybe we start, maybe we can do a little Botox. Maybe we could do some physiotherapy. No electrical stimulation. That has been shown by many studies that that doesn't, in fact, it may cause more synchinesis. It's, the jury is not out on it, but there's been enough indication that maybe it doesn't help. And I'm going to watch that individual very closely over the six, nine, 12 month period. At the 12 month junction, if the synchinesis is stable, the not changing a lot, then that's when I like to proceed. I used to treat people, oh, let's try a little, you know, Botox physiotherapy. It, great, those things are amazing. But to me, we just couldn't get the smile great without surgery. And that's the key because people want a complete improvement in not only their eyes, not only the tension, but their smile. So that's why I combine these treatments. So we want the synchinesis to be stable or the facial nerve regeneration to be stable. Not, I mean, everyone changes, goes up and down 5%, but not like significant changes. And that typically takes about a year. So if someone's diagnosed with Bell's palsy at three months, they have no tone, no activity, we need to really investigate that individual. If they have tone and activity, we follow up and keep a close eye until we see recovery. That goes the same scenario as someone who had an acoustic neuroma. If they start getting regeneration, we continue observing them until their synchinesis or facial nerve regeneration is stable. Typically it takes about a year. Same thing with Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Same thing with someone who had a fracture. So that's kind of the way that I proceed with my, my uh, patients. Okay. Um, are, we, are we doing okay? Is everyone getting, uh, I know it's a lot of information, but I hope that it's useful. Um, Okay, yeah, this is a great question too. How important is correct terminology when describing one's facial palsy? For example, I often read on my support group people saying, my child was born with Bell's palsy or I have Bell's palsy from surgical removal of my acoustic neuroma. 
I find that facial paralysis is incorrectly called Bell's palsy, then it's not given the gravitas it merits. Thoughts, question mark. Amazing question. I couldn't agree with you more. We need to correct even our own doctors. Okay, there are doctors that don't understand the difference between uh, someone who had Bell's palsy causing their facial paralysis or someone who had Ramsey-Hunt syndrome causing their facial paralysis or acoustic neuroma surgery resulting in facial paralysis. Facial paralysis or facial palsy is the name to anyone who has a facial nerve disorder. The cause of it could be Bell's palsy, could be Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, could be Mobius syndrome, Lyme disease, uh, temporal bone fracture. So it is a very important thing that we need to educate. You guys need to educate doctors actually on utilizing the correct terminology. So that's a fantastic question. How can awareness of facial palsy be improved in hospitals and amongst doctors so that Bell's palsy is seen as a diagnosis of exclusion, not presentation? Fantastic. We just went through that, right? Because I don't give anyone the diagnosis of Bell's palsy until at three months, they have had some tone, muscle regeneration, laugh whine activity. And this, when I give talks to my colleagues, to uh, um, uh, general doctors, emergency room doctors, this is what I do. Unfortunately, it's really hard. I want to give this talk to neurologists. I want to give this talk to uh, you know, national societies of neurology, internal medicine, family medicine, emergency medicine. It's really hard to actually get an invitation or actually be able to, because um, it's just, there's preconceived notions about this and they don't find Bell's palsy a very important and exciting process. So it's really, really hard to do that. But thank you for bringing that up. Um, and then we have another question that's very, very similar uh, from Elizabeth from Australia. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, that talks about how we may want to talk to the international facial palsy medical community over changing the name of Bell's palsy to idiopathic facial nerve palsy or paralysis. I think it's an amazing idea, and I think it's a great approach. Um, it's going to be a hard one because... Bell's palsy diagnosis, we can change in the facial nerve community. It's going to be very, very difficult, and it's going to take generations to change in the emergency medicine community, in the internal medicine community, in the family medicine community, and even in the neurology community. So it's a great approach, and uh, I would love to do that. Um, okay, so this is. Um, I'm gonna stop with this question and then I actually I'm gonna open up so people can talk and maybe follow up on some of the things that I've said. They may have questions um, and we'll go from there. I have facial paralysis and synchinesis from Bell's palsy on the right side of my face. I can feel the bone behind my ear much bigger than on the left. I heard you mentioned before that the bone around the facial nerve might be a cause of facial paralysis. Can you elaborate? So the bone, bones don't get inflamed. Most likely what you're feeling is we have a muscle behind the ear called the auricularis that actually, you know, it's a muscle that really is embryologic and from our evolutionary, we don't use it. Um, and that muscle may be getting very overactive, but the bone itself is inflammation of the nerve inside the bone that causes like Bell's palsy or Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. So it's not the bone itself, but definitely get it evaluated. Make sure it's not a lymph node or something like that. I think uh, that's an important um, area to look at. Okay, so why don't we, Lisa, if you don't mind, maybe we can um, have people unmute and ask any questions or follow-up questions on what I've described and elaborated on. Um, and uh, go from there. Sure, I think that's a great idea. Let's just for a few minutes. Um, let's and just you say guys can un, un, un video, uh, show your video if you like, yeah. which will be cool for everybody to yeah. kind of 
Thank you know, you. okay, John, I see. Let's all know. kind of moderate here so we don't get everybody. Okay, I see John. Did you have a question? Oh, hang on just a second. Let me see. All right, we can't hear you. Let me see. Let me see. And you can also put questions in the chat box because I know that's something. Yeah, if you can't, but you, yeah, if you got me there, John, can you unmute? Are you good now? Oh, hang on. There we go. You should be unmuted. And you can, if you can't, if we can't hear you, you can type it in. Um, can you, uh, Lisa, unmute everyone? I think you muted everybody. Okay, now I think everyone's, oh uh, no. Can you see if you I can- I don't unmute? have a group unmute, but I can go. Here, I can do, um, here, let's start. I think you can mute, unmute yourselves, can't you? So let me hear, we'll go. Is there anyone else that would like? Uh, I have a question. Okay, okay go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I had paralysis because I have, my English is a little um, difficult. Um, okay, I had a brain tumor in the left side and uh, I had a brain surgery and the uh, approach of retrosigmoid and uh, I had paralysis in my left side. And uh, yes. I had many surgeries for recovery, my symmetric, but not my improvement. And uh, my question is, I have, I have, I gonna, uh, I will take another surgery for improvement, my smile is like a uh, um, and it's, it's, uh, I'm sorry, whoever is not speaking, uh, Maria, can you hold on? Whoever is not uh, asking the question, can you mute yourself? Because we're hearing a oh, lot of background on. noise. There, I thought. They decided they weren't, uh, because they lost so much on it. I think it. Maria, is that your family? I'm sorry, I can't. I think everyone else is muted. Okay, no problem. Oh, okay. Or if you go ahead, Maria, and then we'll try. Yeah, if we can. Yeah. Uh, um, my question is, I I gonna take another surgery for um, temporalis graft and uh, for improve my smile. Okay. It's good. It's good this this surgery for because I wanna show my tips. You know, okay. it just my smile is not complete. It's so asymmetric. Yeah. And then my my question is, good this surgery improve the better than the smile? So it's a, it's a really good question, difficult question to answer, honestly, without doing full evaluation of what's going on. Definitely the temporalis tendon transfer is one of the lovely tools that I like using for some of my patients, not all of them. Depending on the situation, circumstance, process, age, what the desires are, what they've had done before, and so forth. Um, the limitations um, of the temporalis tendon transfer are that it doesn't provide a spontaneous natural emotional smile because it's activated by a different nerve than the facial nerve. It's activated by the trigeminal nerve. So you have to bite down to get the movement. So it's really good for two things. Uh, one is it does give a nice lift and uh, of the face in that area. And number two, it does give, when you bite down some activity and a movement and may involve the teeth or not. The scenarios I really love using the temporalis tendon transfers are three scenarios that I really like. One, uh, in individuals who've had cancer uh, of the parotid gland that is extensive and involved the nerve and the muscles and so forth, um, uh, it tends to be a very, very nice, uh, quick recovery. Aesthetically, I've come up with a couple of really cool uh, additions to it that gives us a really pretty laugh line and elevation. So that's one scenario I like. The second scenario is somewhat similar to what you're describing. People who've had gracilis flaps or other flaps that haven't given them the ultimate outcome they were looking for. And the third scenario is 
using it for individuals with Mobius syndrome who have no activity. Um, not always, but sometimes it's a great option in addition to using like a gristleless flap. So I like temporalis tendon transfer. Um, I don't like the temporalis muscle overflow, which was what I was like, what I learned like 25 years ago. Um, the tendon transfer is much more aesthetic when it's done correctly in my, in my experience. And um, it's a good operation. But again, I like to customize the operations. So it's hard to really give anyone like, oh, for this scenario, I do this. So everyone needs to, and this is the thing that I try to really educate my patients, my colleagues is, it's not cookie cutter. This is a complicated, complex process. Look at like for yourself, you've had multiple surgeries. You've got, so it's got to be tailored to you. And that's why I like having, I do every procedure that's available, but everyone gets a different procedure, maybe a combination. And everyone has a very, very different uh, approach. So there's no cookie cutter situation in this. Okay, hope, thanks. Um, Dr. Z, I'm going to read a couple out of the chat real quick. And then um, I think, Annie, was this from you? If you want to mute too, you can go ahead and ask this then. Hi, thank you. Hi, go ahead. You can ask. Hi, Annie. Hi. Uh, yeah, I just recently had heard that surgery to correct synchinesis or to help with that was discouraged once we get older, that maybe the results aren't as strong. I'm just wondering, um, the synchinesis seems like the older I get, the, the worse it, it is. And so is it something that I need to kind of act on instead yeah. of keep dreaming about? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I um, thank you for that question. Great question. I completely disagree with the age factor with uh, synchinesis treatment or almost any any treatment, if someone's healthy, uh, medically healthy, uh, and has no contraindications to surgery, I think there are, whether you have synchinesis or not, there are amazing opportunities. Synchinesis, I did a large study of various ages. We saw very little difference between you know, individuals. Um, from a timing perspective, do it when there's no urgency in this. You remember there are certain, scenarios there is an urgency like you've had a brain tumor you're nervous paralyzed for six nine twelve months that there's an urgency to get that surgery done for synchinesis there is i wouldn't say there is an urgency i do think that people who are doing it earlier do get a little bit better results but not significantly different um but i'm also a big fan of let's get on with our lives right we why do we want to delay things if there are opportunities to improve your quality of life, emotional wellness, uh, uh, feeling good about yourself, this is for yourself. This is not for anyone else. That's the other thing. This is not for family members, it's not for loved ones. This is for you and your own personal quest for you know, yourself. So uh, waiting around also, I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of that either. I think like, Whenever you're ready, emotionally, physically, go for it, you know? And yeah, there are risks, very minimal um, for the most part. Outcomes, really great. And, um, you know, the majority of people, you know, are um, at least, again, I, I can't speak for, you know, uh, other facial nerve experts, but, you know, our facial nerve procedures, satisfaction rates are really, really high. Uh, and, um, you know, higher than most other plastic surgical procedures, interestingly enough, including um, rhinoplasty and breast augmentation and tummy tucks and all, all the cosmetic procedures. So it's, it's pretty wonderful uh, to proceed with that. Great, thanks. thank you. Um, okay. Christy, you had um, typed in a question too. Do you want to ask it or do you want me to read it? I think you're... If you want to unmute yourself, or I can, I can read it. I should. There she is. Am, I, Go ahead. am I unmuted now? Yep, yeah, you're Christy. Great. Go ahead, Christy. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, I'll just read my question. I had an acoustic neuroma 
and I had facial paralysis as a result. My biggest issue is synkinesis in my left eye, which doesn't blink as often as my right eye, so they don't, they don't blink in concert. I also have no tear production in my left eye, so um, I use a lot of product in my eye because it's dry all the time. And when I cry, I only tear in my right eye. So uh, my question is, will I ever have tear production again in that eye? Or How is long that ago was damaged? your acoustic neuroma? Um, it was in 2017. Okay. I, unfortunately, I doubt a lot is gonna change because you're now about five years almost, almost uh, yeah. from your surgery. Um, so I think the what you see is what you're gonna have, maybe a little better once in a while, maybe a little worse once in a while. Um, now, some of the cool things, the tearing, I don't think we're gonna be able to help with that uh, or anyone because tearing is, mainly related to two reasons people tear. One is actually from dryness, right? I, it, when your eyes are dry, they actually overproduce tears because it's trying to fix it or from a lack of tear production from your lacrimal gland, which is a gland just right above your eye around the outer part of the um, uh, uh, upper eyelid. And that can get impacted with facial palsy. So, I have to see, obviously, I think your eyes, but there have been a couple of really cool recent additions to the procedures that I do where we're able to reroute some of the local nerves to help the eye blink better, close better, function better in patients with synkinesis, and also nerve grafts to help people who have complete paralysis who are early on in their acoustic neuroma or other uh, other process to help their eyes close. So there are some newer approaches that are really, really great, not perfect in improving the blinking and eye function and so forth, but every, it, it really depends on the issue. But I don't think to answer your question, I don't think your tear production is going to significantly change unless the problem is with your dry eyes so if you improve your eye closure and blinking, maybe that'll help reduce your, uh, you know, uh, impact. But your problem is you you just don't tear on that side, so um, it's going to be hard to really see that changing. So would I also then not benefit from just having overall improvement with the facial paralysis? I mean, if if I could just have some. Um, benefit from, um, well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know what I'm trying to say right yeah, now. You're, you're as, without, tre without probably treatment, your facial nerve condition isn't going to change a lot over the next few years. Maybe it'll get 1% better or worse, but it's not going to change a lot. But with some of the surgical and non-surgical treatments, I think, again, depending on what the situation is, there are a lot of opportunities to get better. Okay. Not your tearing, but maybe the other stuff. Right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, I did want to get John's question in because I know he had tried and I you did message us. I think you're, you can um, you try again, but I think your basic question was, are there exercises that are beneficial to help with facial paralysis? Yeah, so... <laughs> John, I guess you please again. I'll just think, yeah, go ahead and answer. Okay, that. so okay. Um, I would say retraining, physiotherapy, neuromuscular uh, retraining, these are all wonderful opportunities for people who have uh, synkinesis. People who have complete paralysis, very, very difficult to retrain or do anything. So I wouldn't waste a ton of money, effort, energy for if you have complete paralysis. But when you have synkinesis, there are a lot of opportunities because part of the problem is like the tightness that you get, right? The cramping that you get. So the exercises and the release and the stretching and exercises and so forth can help with those tremendously. I would see experts, and Lisa has probably a list of people that 
you can uh, reach out to around the country. Uh, but now again, with Zoom and so forth, there are a lot of like, you know, remote things that you can do to get really the best people involved. Uh, and uh, I would really encourage you to do that. But yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, with that. Uh, not perfect, but definitely there. Um, Lisa, the, V. Anderson, I think we missed that question. So let me just uh, read that. I had recurrent Bell's palsy every year at about the same time for seven years. My neurologist prescribed acupuncture. I haven't had an episode since. I still have residual effects left over from Bell's palsy. Any su suggestions for uh, for me? I really do miss my smile. No, I think you you have you know great opportunities regardless of how many times you've had Bell's palsy to get improvement of your smile with the some of the techniques that we've outlined with um, you know uh, surgery, retraining, Botox, etc. So I would, you know, definitely seek out a facial nerve expert. And I think, you know, you know, go for it. Um, even if you do surgery and you have Bell's palsy, again, the nerves, a lot of the surgical procedures, they've permanently kind of rerouted and reconnected your nerves more appropriately. So the chance of the synchinesis being worse is not very high. So I would definitely reach out. Um, and then let's see. Um, we do have I, a few more. Do you want to keep going or do we, or we could? Yeah, we, know, we have three email. more. Let, okay. I have three more. Let's. Okay, we'll you know, do the three more and then we'll, we'll stop after that. We won't yeah. take any more questions, but go ahead. Are you no seeing problem. them then? Yeah, I okay. see them. Okay, have, great. Okay, 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 this is from Machio. I've had Ramsey Hunt syndrome three months and I've had a relapse two weeks ago. I'm on steroids again, no improvement so far. Even worse, what's the prognosis? Should I have another MRI? Um, and uh, this is uh, someone in Australia. Um, I, this, this is a little bit probably uh, complicated to really answer over uh, without knowing all the details. So what I would say is find a great ENT or facial nerve expert in your area and really work with them uh, to make sure that they're happy with the imaging you've gotten and they'll see the prognosis. And maybe that your prognosis will be amazing and you'll get your smile back. It's hard to know, but what I wanna know, I, it sounds like you've had an MRI once, which is a great if it was negative, but definitely talk to your ENT doctor. Okay, okay. no problem. Jack? Uh, my son's 13. I'm presented with facial process at one year, but was misdiagnosed. So any effort to correct didn't begin until he was approximately four years of age. Two mastoidectomies, nerve testing showed minimal nerve function. By this time, he's around nine. He asked me if we could do more surgeries at that time. He's comfortable with himself and confident, but I worry about him moving into teen years and inevitable relationship issues that may arise given Time factor involved. Is it safe to assume options are fairly limited? Should he change his mind and want to pursue correction? I mean, there are always options at any age, but I agree with you in your assessment. And this is the decision that I think parents need to make. And if I'm a parent of a young, you know, someone who's eight or nine years old, I want them to get their smile corrected as soon as possible and get the best possible outcome that they can. There's no guarantees, but the results of kind of what, you know, and again, it depends on what the issue is. I don't know, I mean, without examining your son, I don't know what I would recommend, but there are a lot of options, whether it's complete paralysis, where it's partial, this is the time to proceed. I, in my opinion, before they go, you know, into middle school, because sometimes some of the procedures take us a couple of years to do to get to the, you know, our final results. So I would move if it were my son right away doing that. Um, okay, Julianne, I was diagnosed with Bell's palsy during pregnancy. Is there any research that shows the likelihood of BP recurring again in the pregnancy, in pregnancy going forward? Thank you for spending so much time. That's a great question. Pregnancy is um, commonly, you know, or Bell's palsy is commonly associated with pregnancy. Um, 
have I seen patients who've gotten Bell's palsy twice in two different pregnancies? I actually don't think I've ever had a patient like that. Maybe I have, and I don't remember. So what I tell people is, listen, having, you know, move forward, do what you would have done, whether you would have had Bell's palsy or not. That's again, what I would do. Everyone has to decide on their own because the chances are pretty low and, you know, having, um, you know, your family, uh, you know, the way that you want is precious. So I, I, in my opinion, if it were happening to me, I would, I would go for it. Um, I think that's, that's it. Any other comments, um, thoughts? Jennifer? Yeah, Jennifer, you did ask about some online group, Facebook oh. groups, and um, I'll post a, I would, we were going to do that anyway, I'll post on Facebook, and I'll send you the list of them too, there's several, fill in the gap between we have meetings, which I know aren't very frequent right now, and with, you know, COVID and everything, we haven't been able to meet physically, but there are several online Facebook groups that, where you can immediately get answers from other people, and um, Elizabeth, I don't think Elizabeth's not on here. She has a really wonderful group and there's a few others. So I will post that and Jennifer, I'll send you a link to that too. But Dr. Zizade, closing thoughts then? Um, no, this has been wonderful. I kind of actually like the Zoom format. I've done a lot of Facebook lives. Mm -hmm. um, I like the Zoom format. It's kind of cool. You we see can kind of interact a little bit. Yeah, I like it. I like, and I think people can interact with one another if they like. So mm -hmm. this was really nice. And um, uh, wonderful, thank you for organizing. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here. And uh, I am passionate about, um, you know, uh, getting better and better and better results and helping people uh, kind of achieve uh, everything they want. So um, this is really exciting. And uh, thank you for including me. Well, thank you for joining us and taking time out of your weekend. And thank you, Barbara, for helping out too. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Hopefully, yeah, we can maybe do these once a month then and, you know, have you send in questions ahead of time. So we'll be, yeah, this is, we enjoyed doing this. So happy facial paralysis yeah. awareness week. And thank we'll you, hopefully do, see you again soon. Everyone thank you. Say, yeah, log on. Thank say you. Hi.